buenas tardes. Bienvenidos. 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 Bienvenidos
I can say, a long time partnership now already between the regional program Political Dialogue South Mediterranean of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and your highly esteemed institution. And of course, I'm very much looking forward to have uh, this interactive uh, discussion tonight to learn more about where uh, the region, the Arab region stands today, where the so-called modern Arab state uh, is today. And of course, to exchange with you about uh, possibilities of future developments in the region when it comes to a possible outlook. So what was the reason to come up with a publication called uh, The Modern Arab State? We are, as a regional office based in Tunis, uh, constantly trying to bring together, to connect uh, stakeholders, especially from the civil society, from the southern Mediterranean region. So we uh, bring together civil society actors from, let's say, Turkey via uh, the Palestinian territories and not the North African uh, countries to Morocco in order to connect them between each other and to bring their point of view to a European audience. So that's what we are actually constantly doing with our dialogue programs, with our conferences, and obviously with our publications. So we have a number of different uh, publication series that we recently came up with be it a uh, publication on questions of maritime security, on the influence of the GCC in North Africa, or border questions, for example, between the regions of Tatawin and Wagla, so between uh, Tunisia and Algeria. But one of the most interesting topics uh, for us in the last year indeed was to uh, question and to critically analyze where the region stands 10 years after the so-called Arab Spring, after the uprisings that started in late 2010, and at least in our interpretation, and that's also kind of the argument in the book, are still ongoing, especially if we look at uh, the Sudan or also Algeria and everything that happened there in 2019. And one could even uh, provocatively argue that uh, even the developments that are now taking place in Tunisia are to some extent also still an outcome of what started in 2010 with the uprisings in many countries of the region. So we wanted to see where the region is 10 years after the beginnings of the uprisings, what the younger generation in the region thinks, which is why we conducted a representative survey in six countries of the region. You can also find it on our website. And then the, the next and let's say the final product of this whole discussion was the book, The Modern Arab State. And we uh, decidedly uh, chose the very provocative topic of uh, the modern Arab state, knowing that there is no monolithic uh, Arab state and that you have uh, multiple realities in the region with very different political systems when it comes to regional countries and with uh, to some extent, even non-comparable dynamics within uh, the region and the different countries in the region. That's why we needed expertise and why we reached out to very uh, well-esteemed uh, authors. Uh, Youssef Sherif, uh, Tunisia-based researcher, is the editor of the publication, and Amr Ali is one of uh, the uh, authors that, um, and we are very happy about it, uh, contributed with a great uh, chapter to uh, the publication. We will learn more about his uh, chapter in a minute and about the key components of where he thinks the modern Arab state, again, um, one should think about the plural, I would say, uh, stands today. But we will also have a short um, video at the beginning that gives, I think, a great overview, just a short clip about the direction and the key components of the books. And afterwards, as mentioned, I'm really very much looking forward to this discussion. Thanks once again to Casa Arabi and the great team here for making all this happening. To you, Karim Hauser, for hosting us. And um, yeah, let's have a great discussion and an insightful evening tonight. Thank you very much.
Muchas gracias, eh, Toma. Thank you very much, Thomas. Yeah, the publication that Thomas Hawk was mentioning is available uh, at just outside uh, the, on the table, at just outside uh, this room. And uh, you will, there you will see a short introduction to the contents of this publication that can be found online on the Foundation's website. We thought, I mean, we believe this was quite refreshing to be combining the voices of two different speakers. We would have loved to have Fabia Sofia with us, but unfortunately, due to the circumstances and the, and the, and the um, uh, restrictions on international travel that we are now having to endure, well, uh, Fabia had to come from Jordan, then uh, go back to 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 come to Spain and move back to Jordan in a very short time period of time, and with this quarantine and different restrictions, uh, it was simply not feasible. So hopefully, with this hybrid format, we can have her virtually with us, and uh, we can still have her with us, and to hear about her approach to novels and her reimagining of Arabs in this 21st century. We have also um, made some some uh, reflections on this uh, uh, 10th anniversary of uh, the Arab Springs. And last week, we were just um, presenting a book on the subject. And uh, uh, we will first hear from Fadia and then Amro Ali, but uh, Nieves has now the floor. Thank you very much, Karim. First of all, I'd like to thank on behalf of the master's degree on Arab contemporary Arab studies at the University, Autonomous University of Madrid. I'd like to thank you for organizing this event, uh, for welcoming here our students as well. And well, very simply put, I'm going to read out some words that I've just uh, written. Uh, I'll use my notes to, to try and um, be respectful and mindful of time and, and and then give the floor to, to Fadia Hakir. So every year, my first uh, Arab literature lessons uh, in university, contemporary Arab literature, uh, the first question I usually ask my students is whether we need to consider that Arab literature is uh, only that literature that is written in Arabic or if we could also consider other works written in different languages, such as English, French, Hebrew, Spanish, or Catalan. Then I, on the blackboard, I write down a short list of authors where you always have uh, Fadia Fakir. Hello, Fabia. She's here with us today. And even though this uh, roll call is much longer, uh, I always mention the names of the uh, Yubran, Halil Yubran, Tahir Ben Yiloun, Dres Shraibi, George Enain, Ata Swif, Anton Shamas, Hisham Mata, Lila Slivani, or Nayad El Hashmi, even though I could, of course, add many, many others. They are, they all are writers coming from different countries belonging to different generations, different ethnicities and religions. And they decided to write in, uh, in other languages uh, than Arabic, uh, or very often, but not always, in the language of the former uh, colonial state in the countries of origin. Well, that decision uh, comes stems from a multiplicity of reasons all of them linked to their own respective um, careers. So this discussion that I, I launch in my classroom, this debate is usually very lively and interesting. The idea is not really to, to elicit a yes or a no, but to, to put the question, the issue on the table, the issue of the Arab literary canon what basis uh, um, is it being underpin is, uh, is uh, underpinning this uh, canon 
and how difficult it is to break away from it, or at least trying to change it somewhat to include literature that is not written in Arabic. So with the, uh, in general, the academia has paid attention to these authors and their work. It's been mostly from the perspective of the Department of English Studies, coming from uh, the so-called post-colonial criticism, professors and researchers have raised the main issues and problems that have become mainstream and not now um, on the, in the spotlight regarding the, these authors and the particularities of their work. These authors could be either uh, applauded and acclaimed and prestigious in the West and sometimes just the opposite, they are in a very unstable ground um, be when they criticize parts or the, of their culture of origin. And some uh, Arab critics and even Western critics are um, uh, saying that they are, um, you know, they are just biased against the Arab world. So it is this very in-between position you know, uh, and in between, in between being a very post-colonial critics criticism term that uh, puts them in on a landmine, uh, with uh, uh, in a sea of misunderstandings. So, leaving your uh, tribe of origin or uh, not really sharing the official discourse, be it uh, the Arab one or the Western discourse, sometimes you really have to pay a very high high price for it. Fadi Fikir has been called a post-colonial writer, and she says she, she could agree with that. But she has also been criticized when uh, there were critics that were not were, were quite as pleased when Fikir denunciated, as she usually does, the patriarchy and uh, the domination on women and those ancestral traditions that uh, uh, undercut uh, women's freedoms and their set of religious rules, Islamic rules, that try and uh, make it uh, to paranyze an archaic order and the domination on the women's minds and bodies. So those critics usually call Fekir a colonial, a colonialist writer. They say that uh, the, her vision uh, of religion, of Islam, uh, her vision of uh, uh, Arab women and Arab men. It's just a vision of the views of the old colonists, so the old colonizing state. And that's something that still uh, exists in the Western world. And uh, uh, so they try to sometimes disqualify her work, saying that she is neo-colonialist or orientalist. I think that's very, very, uh, it's almost on the verge of being called that, just that. Fadi Fakir was born in Amman. Uh, her father was of Bedouin origin. Her mother came from a Circassian family. She studied English literature, the University of Amman, and later she moved to England to uh, finish her studies and get her PhD. Uh, currently, she is living in Durham, and she is where she is a, a lecturer on creative literature. It would be impossible to just present uh, all of her work, just uh, plentiful and very diverse. So you can always visit her website. I'd like to highlight uh, some of her novels and a more theoretical uh, kind of book that it's uh, equally interesting. Her first novel, uh, published novel, is uh, Nissanit, published in 1989. It is followed by Pillars of Salt in 1996, and then in 2007, my name is Sama, that was translated one year later in, uh, into Spanish, where the very literal translation of Mi Nombre is Salma. Then some others, uh, later came some others, but the, these two, this last two, the two last ones I've just mentioned, are the ones that have raised a greater critical interest and uh, that uh, summarize perfectly uh, the master, um, um, the, the main lines of her literary project. Between Nissanit and Pillars of Salt, Ferdi Fekir um, published a book titled In the House of Silence in 1998. It is a selection and translation into English of 
a body work of 13 uh, autobiographical texts uh, written by Arab women. And uh, to them, uh, was added a, a, her own autobiographical text, which is also a very uh, highly recommended. These autobiographies show perfectly well that Arab women from the very beginning of Arab modernity, in the beginning uh, by mid uh, 19th century, never, never uh, resorted to silence. They never gave up. And they were activists, thinkers, uh, militants, and even leaders of uh, different movements, uh, be it feminist movements and others, and writers of autobiographies, uh, novelists, poets, her voices and her words have always had a present and an effect. Even though the linguistic or the language barrier sometimes has uh, made it impossible for the Western audience, in this case, the Anglo-Saxon public, this, this has not allowed for the um, uh, Anglo-Saxon world, the Western world to know, uh, to be very familiar with their names, their experience and the uh, of, of telling their stories. Um, Fadi uh, uh, is always given voice to some women, uh, for instance, Maha or Um Saad in Pillars of Salt, Salma in My Name is Salma Nakwa in Willow Trees, Joan Weep. They're women that have been dominated by their, pair, their fathers, their brothers or their husbands, um, threatened uh, uh, um, because of the primitive laws and, and, def and defense of uh, uh, the honor or uh, secluded uh, for uh, forever in an asylum because they decided to rebel against any some uh, social or religious rule. Even if it's uh, regardless of whether it is uh, which of these voices is speaking uh, or denouncing the situation or telling the truth, they sometimes they use. Uh, a journey uh, that to free themselves of those of that domination. Some others uh, start from home, some others start in their own town, and sometimes they end up in England. But uh, whatever it is, Fadi is uh, uh, making literature out of her many life experiences. She's not romanticizing or fetishizing or victimizing her protagonists, but she is clearly denouncing the abuse and the resistance to that abuse by women. And then just the last reflection, terms such as hybridity, diaspora, ex exile, belonging, or identity are usually um, employed to describe writers that uh, seems such as Fadi Fakir that have chosen to write in a, in a language that is in, different to their mother tongue. In, in Spain, we are very here, very muffled echoes of the raging discussions and debates that in other parts of the world are created by the work of those Anglo-Arab writers uh, or even uh, French-speaking um, writers. But we should uh, get to know them better and um, join that discussion. We should accept a widening our, our horizon. It is necessary. And uh, to break away with the dogmatic uh, criteria that have been used to analyze um, the, their work and accepting the difference without any reservations and diversity in the uh, uh, present Arab world, forgetting about political or religious uh, uh, taking political or religious sides because there's other many others because it is we have Arab writers that can um, that belong to two different literary histories and we need to accept that. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, eh, Nieves Paradela, por esta, por esta... Thank you very much, Nieves Paradela, for your wonderful introduction to the word of uh, to the work of uh, Fadi Afaki, and uh, thank you for posing all those questions that uh, Fadi will uh, probably answer later on. We have uh, Fadi connected from the Durham University. Fadi. 
So I would say the floor is yours, but since it's a virtual uh, 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 connection, you can have the ceiling as well if you want. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, thank you so much for, for the introduction to, um, to the, for the general um, I want to start by thanking Kata Arab, um, the organizing team. So uh, hold on a second, Fadia. We seem to have lost your audio. Uh, let can us check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. But you're so breaking. Can you hear me? Yes, let's let's try again. Uh, I just, I just want to say thank you for for inviting me, um, especially Kata Arab Autonomous University of Madrid. And uh, other sponsors. We and have. Uh, to be here and to um, I'm, I'm sorry, Fadia. I think we are having some trouble with your connection. Alguna dirección por la parte técnica? Is there anything we can do to restore the connection? If Padia can put the telephone closer to her mouth. Audio connection, it's going through your phone. If you could uh, just bring it closer to to you. Okay. okay. So uh, can you hear me now? Is it better? Yes, yes that's better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, I keep that I'm not fond of, but I have to quote him. Uh, when I returned to Britain in 1986 to start a PhD in critical and creative writing, I read V. S. Naipaul, his essay entitled Jasmine, in which he describes the differences between jasmine, the fascinating word, and jasmine, the cold and uninteresting vegetation. Quote, the old lady cut a sprig for me. I stuck it in the top buttonhole in my shirt. I smelt it as I walked back to the hotel. Jasmine, jasmine. But the word and the flower had been separate in my mind for too long. They did not come together. Critics read it as an indication of Naipaul's discovery of the colonial language, English, and its beauty, and his aspiration to become a metropolitan writer. But for me, it symbolizes the, the challenges faced by authors writing in the language of the other. Elementary, for example, was part, part of my mental scape, and I didn't have to uh, look for the more juice to describe it, thus perhaps fossilizing it. My relationship with the Arabic language was like a forbidden love, laden with danger and taboos. In a society governed by strict and traditional values, the use of language freely was hazardous then. And I hasten to add, because I just got back from Jordan after a four month, a long stay of four months, that maybe it's more hazardous than now. The tripartite of politics, religion, and sex were neither discussed at the home near nor in the classroom. I felt incarcerated both physically and linguistically. So I left my homeland and became an expatriate an expatriate, a woman who left her country and language because of domestic, political, and intellectual policing. Like many Arabs living in the West, I decided to cut out the middleman and create an Arab book in the language of the other. The reasons behind each author's de decision varied. But what is certain is that our texts are a byproduct of the colonial encounter. 
and of a rising awareness of multiculturalism that provisionally disowns oneself to listen to and perceive beyond differences, a kinship of gestures and of desire. This is a quotation from Sabulsi. Uh, the writing of some Arabs in the West spreads the divide between two cultures and a result, as a result suffers and benefits from occupying such a dangerous right, linguistically and otherwise. So, the late British uh, Angela Carter, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, taught by Angela Carter, said, uh, describing Pillars of Salt, it is a compulsive read, a feminist vision of Orientalism. She used to give each student a book as a comment on their writing. She gave me Rana Kabbani's book, Europe's Myth of the Orient, Devise and Rule, which uh, analyzes the demeaning of Eastern women in Western narratives, first as women and then as Orientals. This book led quickly to the writings of Edward Said. Now the misogynist storyteller in Pillars of Salt wouldn't have been born without feminism, Orientalism, um, postmodernism, and travel writing. He also kept a reservoir of oral tales, mainly inspired by the Arabian Nights, folk tales, and quotations from the Quran. So the melange turned out to be a novel about memory, representation, conflicting views of history, and sexual politics. It had the unreliable narrator, the indigenous woman, and the mythic ending that was totally fabricated by the Orientalist unreliable storyteller. But the simple, truthful narrative of the native women incarcerated in a mental institution outweighs the framing fabricated tale. Madness is a theme that runs through most of my writing. I was influenced by Arde Lang, the Scottish psychiatrist, whose views on the causes and treatment of mental illness were affected by existential philosophy. He saw madness as a miscommunication and the feelings of patients as valid description of lived experience rather than mental illness. Maha and Umsad flew over the cuckoo's nest and were penalized by a society uncompromising in its norms and customs. Both urban and rural women are punished for their transgressions, locked up in a hospital, and then ultimately institutionalized. I return to the theme in my short story under the cypress tree, but this time the main character subjected to electric shocks is a white woman in 1940s England. The savior comes in the guise of a Bedouin native woman. The first encounter between colonizer and colonized or between Europeans and so-called savages has frequently given rise to the question as to what constitutes our humanity and whether the strange people in we encounter are to be accorded full human status. In the short story, the native invades the colonialist and interacts with her at her home turf or on her home turf. So, uh, so I'm gonna just pass over that and, 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 and say that it was actually writing back to the center, writing back to the center in a, in a different way. Um, I'll skip that because my time is running. I put the timer on. My name is Salma. Uh, I get asked, how do you uh, deal with themes that are problematic, like sexual violence, honor crimes, etc.? So my name is Salma is, is a novel about honor crimes. Uh, it is a classic example of trauma literature with its attempts to get language to speak the unspeakable when witnessing has collapsed and narratives fractured. It is a novel about the constraints of the human condition, migration and racism written in, in a form that is lyrical, disjointed and punctu punctuated with minute descriptions of daily life. It switches almost at random between scenes from Salma's life among her Bedouin family, her years of protective custody, her fight, flight into a monastery and subsequent journey to asylum in England. There are interspersed with episodes from her life in Exeter 
as she attempts to find work, educate herself, and establish a foothold in an alien environment. The disjointed narrative, which I use in most of my fiction, is meant to reflect her tortured self. Seen exclusively from Thelma's point of view, it illustrates her, in her links with her past. The aim is to prevent the reader from feeling any ease of smooth progression towards a resolution. Constantly, we are torn like Selma between a brutal past, an alien country, and its own cruelties, and the bonds of motherhood, family, and culture. Novels are windows to the world. They humanize, bring injustices to the reader's attention, and build cultural bridges. The present and complex reality of England wouldn't be captured without placing the story of the immigrant Selma in the context of the British colonial adventure in India. The novel has no goodies or baddies, and all their characters are tragic figures, even the English landlady Elizabeth, the symbol of the empire who mistreats Selma. Uh, when we discover what Elizabeth had gone through in India and survived, we forgive her excesses. If the discourse in the metropolis aims to dehumanize Arabs and make them disappear to justify collateral damage, my fiction and writings aim to humanize not only the Arabs, but the English, Americans, Indian, etc. It is harder or perhaps easier to choose someone you know very well. What is important is to present the case gently, subtly, and without anger or self-righteousness. Intercultural literature is closely related to migrant and migration literature. It is written by authors like me, whose point of view and subject matter are influenced by multiple cultural spaces. My novel, My Name is Selma, is not only holding a mirror to British society, but being located within the discourse. It engages with it, which may lead to the breakdown of barriers and the development of new cultural rules. In his book, Migra uh, Migration Literature and Hybridity, Mosland argues that Deleuze and Pertin's work function as a philosophical stepping stones that the author utilizes in innovative ways to explore minor literature that does not conform to established codes, a literature which maps geographies and articulates irreducibility and multiplicity. If it is possible to separate sensibility from language, then the body of my work has an Arab attitude, responsiveness, perception, flavor, and identity, expressed through the medium of an, of an Arabized English, an English selected carefully to convey a specific Arab flavor. This is similar to what Indian authors did with the English language, but um, at a much humbler scale. I'm sticking to the time. When I was a freelance journalist, I encountered narratives about us that were ahistorical, reductive, and false. It was important to subject the English language to scrutiny and prove Karl Marx, who wrote, they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented wrong. As author Abdel Raza Gurna said, I could not find myself in the mirror of English fiction. So, authors wanted to um, to write something against the politics, what I call the politics of misrecognition. A person can suffer real damage, real distortion, if the people or society around them mirror back to them a confining or demeaning or contemptible picture of themselves. So they wrote back to the center. Here is an extended metaphor for this cultural shift and disruption of the master narrative. I always tell my students, you need to disrupt the master narrative, whatever the master narrative is. In 2005, a report entitled Blue Bells for Britain was published. That was before Brexit. It stated that the UK had three different species of bluebells but only one of them is indigenous. 
The distinctive distinctiveness of native bluebells could be at risk because it's readily crossbreeds with two Spanish cousins, often planted in gardens and resulting in a fertile hybrid. Alarm bells rang. There was a serious threat posed. I am not joking. There was a serious threat posed to our native bluebells, even though the majority of records received were of pure native bluebells uh, in, uh, in its stronghold habitat. The genetic integrity and purity of the native blue bell was under threat. More research is urgently needed to understand the intermixing of genes between the species. Gardeners must take care to avoid planting Spanish or hybrid plants in the countryside or near native blue bell populations. It was too late for countermeasures. The Spanish invasion was complete and irreversible and the hybrid blue bell took hold. I see writings by authors of Arab and or Muslim heritage as a hybrid bluebell sprouting out here and there in their full ugliness. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Which bluebell is the more beautiful, authentic or aesthetically pleasing? Is there grace in asymmetry? And who is going to judge this myriad of bluebells? and all done at, at, Ox at Oxford University or a young academic in a metropolitan university? Will they completely escape the gaze of those who recognize the other by assimilation? Are hybrids less legitimate? Will they always be frisked at the borders to see whether they are alien, homegrown, or native? Will they survive Charles Terror politics of misrecognition? It was necessary to see an oak in both cultures, imagine it and a jasmine, of course, and then represent it. An oak that is also a Sindian does not belong to the English language and had become mine, yours, ours. It turned into cultural product colored not by subjectivity, but by its subject position. Planted there in the fertile land of the geography of the soul, there is a Granada there in Granada, as I imagine have, it had been. It grows in other ways in the direction of light, a community of polyglots which belong to different ethnicities and religions, but are cultured in peace, is a vision I hold on to in these difficult times. It was a moment in history when colonizer and colonized, or travelers and settlers, coexisted and interacted even within asymmetrical relations of power. Was it possible? Granada is a ripe pomegranate I carry in my suitcase wherever I go. My mother said, one seed out of the 600 will lead you back to heaven. But as an Arab, British, Muslim between brackets, woman, writer, burdened and liberated by all these labels, that crossroads, where all intellectual caravans meet, that transcultural position, that, that transcultural space, that Granada of the mind is paradise. I'll end here and say, I'd be happy to take questions on, on the Arab world now, especially because I feel I can talk about it after four months in Jordan. But thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Fadia Fakir. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to say that on this side at the auditorium, uh, your voice was was voice your voice was was breaking up. Uh, but we were told from our colleagues that uh, on the internet the uh, the connection was very good. So uh, we we let's say that we here in Madrid have. Uh, have struggled to follow you uh, in a way the, your call to disrupt the master narrative was in itself disrupted by the technology. But having said that, the, uh, the talk has been uh, recorded and all of our students will be able to uh, go back and, uh, and listen across. Uh, 
I, I'm gonna um, go to uh, to our second uh, uh, and 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 uh, I just to remind that also people who are uh, a todos aquellos que están eh, conectados en nuestra página. Well, uh, those of you that are uh, linked to our streaming signal uh, through via YouTube, you can always ask questions to Fadia. You are lucky you could listen to her presentation without any audio uh, problems such as we encountered here in Madrid. So feel free to ask any questions using the chat box. Well, and without further ado, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. And uh, uh, always linked to this idea of reimagining the Arabs through literature, through novels, um, such as uh, Fadia just described, creation of hybrids, hybrid characters that are not that do not conform to the mainstream canon. So that leads us to the new social contract. This is something that Ali is going to be telling us about now. And Thomas Holt told us that uh, this is just, this is one of the chapters of the new book published by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And uh, now, um, uh, Amro Ali is going to be telling us about this kinetic karama, this kinetic dignity. It, it could sound quite postmodern, couldn't it? But it is quite an interesting uh, approach to this idea. Uh, his character is not called Samna, it's called uh, Amia. And uh, she is representing, in a way, this. Uh, generation of uh, young Arabs that are trapped in a transition that seem, apparently is leading them nowhere. And this is what Ambro is going to be uh, telling us about. So I don't know whether we have uh, this video for the new Arab state. Maybe we could uh, show it after his talk. Well, let me tell you about uh, Ambra. He is um, a researcher in the Graduate uh, School of Berlin, at study, Muslim Studies in the University of Berlin. He is the youngest member of the German uh, Association of uh, Humanities. He was an Andrew Mellon um, scholar in the Cairo University. He has also been a guest lecturer in the Wissenschaftszentrum, I hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. Well, well, hopefully, yeah, more or less. Then he is, it is the uh, Social Sciences Center in Berlin. He is a PhD on uh, Middle East and Central Asia studies and um, a master's degree on um, political science by the University of Australia. His, um, Areas of research include public spheres, Arab public spheres, uh, the contemporary um, Alexandria, because he is from Alexandria, cities, uh, citizenships, uh, exile, um, sociological and political um, sociology, focused on Yonshul Hand and Hannah Arendt, among others. So, uh, very welcome, uh, be very welcome, Amr Ali, and please go ahead. Uh, shukran. The people in flesh and blood again, away from Zoom conferencing and talks. So I think you're all real. If I can, yeah, you look yani, more than 3D like to me, Yakarim. Uh, the last time I was in Madrid was May 2019, and uh, it was a very different Madrid, I thought. And then I came, and I, I was surprised that people are very happy, you know, uh, especially if coming from Berlin, you wouldn't think there was a coronavirus happening. So it's really good that there's a spirit of joy happening. At least that's what I'm seeing in the streets. Um, so I want to uh, thank uh, Kaz and Casa Araba and the UAM, uh, Karim, Olivia, Malte, Thomas, and everyone involved in the organization of this event. I actually, I'm not used to seeing uh, two different organizations from two different countries uh, come and cover an event 
not related to the country in question, but of another part of, another part of the world. So I, I find this really fascinating. It is a, a very, very intelligent and very brave to do this. And so uh, to Kaz and Kata Arbe and the UAM, I, I take my fez off to you. Um, both, uh, so both these institutes do play a very critical role in tumultuous times, and I cannot imagine it being easy uh, covering the Arab world, but nonetheless, they push on. And I wanted to apologize to the translator. I, I know I can talk a bit fast, so if you can keep up with me, I, I salute you. Um, so let us begin. Oh, sorry. No, you cannot do that to me. <laughs> I, uh, I want to begin with the coffee houses in the Arab world because the coffee houses, the Ahwa, is like a laboratory. It's like a, a social space where ideas and, and political currents can be brewed. And in Egypt, if you went to a coffee house during the era of Mubarak, you went into a coffee house, you saw the picture of the president on the wall. Uh, it was never really cleaned. It was like probably a young version of Mubarak if you went in 2010, but it's there. There's a picture of Mubarak. No one ever told you, the security didn't tell the workers or the owner to put the picture up, but you just did it in case no one, so you don't get any security harassment. And you did it because that is just the logic of what you do. You did it with President Sadat before that, and President Nasser before that, and King Farouk before that, and King Fuad before that. You just put a picture up on the wall of the leader, of the great leader. But then, you know, something happened. If you go into the coffee houses of Cairo and Alexandria today, you don't necess necessarily see the pictures of the current president. And we are talking in the most repressive time in Egypt's modern history. Why are there no, or most cafes or coffee houses I've seen, I have not seen it. Why in the most repressive period in Egyptian history do we not see the president's picture? And this really got me thinking. And I am of the view that before 2011, there was a take it for granted authoritarianism. You know, like you didn't really have to try hard to be a dictator because there was already a complicit agreement about this. But now there is, you really have to try hard. You really have to push extreme efforts, whether it's building bigger prisons or be, uh, regular raids and so forth. We're talking about raw um, tiring in a way. So the question may arise, what is the coffee house owner doing? Are they salvaging their dignity in small ways? And this is someone who's in if the field of sociology, I always recommend, or just everyday life, always look out for the nuances because you know the small leak can sink a big ship. And it brings me to the idea of karama, dignity. If anyone was old enough to remember 2011, I'm really speaking like I'm really old and it's only been 10 years, but I know we have a lot of students, so I don't know if you really remember this phrase. <laughs> Sorry, that happened. So the word karama, was very common in the protest chants in 2011. It was a long horaya, uh, which was freedom and bread uh, Daesh. So he had, you know, uh, and social justice. And so dignity was actually a new entrant. And dignity was never used before in global protest movements. Uh, dignity um, has rarely been considered a political matter. But what happened in 2011, karama, dignity, was now tied to a new citizenship uh, paradigm among Arab youth. And this was a marked shift from the traditional concept of sharaf, uh, honor, which had, which, and sharaf, honor has much more uh, strong connections to patriarchy, to, uh, to sex, to shame, honor killings, uh, and a fragile identity that can only be reasserted uh, by resorting to violence. So, Dignity was really considered a political matter, but somehow it magically, not magically, but it somehow did become uh, a, a, a demand in 2011 and left lots of traces for us afterwards. The, uh, but before that, the word karama has long been reserved for the loftiness of the nation, for liberation struggles. Dignity for the individual meant a moral virtue uh, that constituted an apolitical being. Its Arabic counterpart, however, karama, made a phenomenal leap. Karama jumped from the moral into the political realm, sort of like a rare cross-species transmission. Think of it like a good version of the coronavirus, okay? And thus becoming a political force in its own rights. 
And that's why Karama spreads throughout the Arab countries, as well as like you, like in Syria, the Friday Dignity of, of um, the Friday of Dignity. Uh, Karama was used that in, in that sense uh, on, on protest signs, on, on slogans, and so forth. Now, the word karama originates from the root word, uh, from various verses of the Quran, uh, which essentially means to venerate, to treat with deference, to like better, um, to give preference to, uh, to the other. Although karama means dignity, uh, and I, I think the English word karama, uh, English word dignity doesn't do justice to the Arabic words, because it really goes deeper. Uh, because in Arabic, karama partners with iz, which means prestige. Ja, which means repute. Ihtiram, which means respect. Hurma, which means sanctity. Manzala, which means inherent status and rank. And Kimma, which means one's inalienable worth. So in a sense, it's shown of religious, cultural, and tribal affiliations. And it is not difficult to see why dignity jumped uh, into a universal uh, humanism. So in, uh, to, really, to give you a, a recap, when in 1952, when there was a revolution, uh, and Nasser and Alexandria University sent a letter to Nasser, the, the young leader who, who led the coup, and asked him for uh, freedom, democracy, and individual dignity, karama fardeya. This was not understood at the time. It didn't make sense to him, because in the post-colonial world, individual dignity was something that was linked to Western idea of individual ethics. You had to, dignity could only be for the nation, the bigger, the bigger picture. So what you see over the decades uh, is that the word karama is never used in academia or in uh, discourse. It's used more for the bigger picture, not for the individual. Uh, up until the 90s, you don't see much use in much use except for a modest set of Palestinian writings. But somehow in the 2000s, the word karama became very popular. So we see this word mushrooming to, um, as, to signal the welfare of individuals as primacy. For example, Al Karama for Human Rights, set up in Switzerland by Algerian Qatari human rights activists in 2004, Karama for Women's Rights in, uh, in 2009, set up in Cairo, Karama Human Rights Film Festival, an annual six day film festival in Amman, Jordan, set up in 2000, uh, 2010. And Tunisia was the, was the first to demonstrate that Karama emerged not only as a form of bottom up universal humanism, but independently and outside the confines of academia religious secular debates, and even human rights organizations. So what happened was in 2011, individual dignity was recognized by the new revolutions, except now it's swept up into a huge collective force. And that's when we see a shift from the nationalist to the citizen martyr. So the 2000s and 2011 produced the new uh, Arab citizen martyr. Like if you remember Mohammed al-Dura in 2000, who was killed by Israelis in, uh, in Gaza, uh, Khaled Said in Egypt, 2010, uh, Bouazizi in 2010, uh, um, Syria's Hamza Ali al Khatib in 2011. And so all these galvanizing, galvanizing icons that came about and in subsequent years. And to put dignity in a everyday context, um, A frequent line that's put, uh, that's said to women in Egypt who complain of sexual harassment of Maxa would be, uh, it's not unusual for them to say to them in the streets, someone will say to them, you shouldn't complain about sexual harassment because it makes our country look bad. So think about that for a moment, okay? So this is not really fixing the problem because it's really talking about honor, but dignity would take it to another level. Now. The problem with this frame mindset, which is applicable to the rest of the many Arab countries, is that it takes no regard for the woman's dignity, which confers the karama, which confers inherent worth independent of any context and perceptions. That's what karama should, would be about. So dignity is a moral equalizer, it, as a matter that uh, honor struggles to attain. As uh, Khosrowsov uh, succinctly puts it, in the logic of dignity, both parties to a dispute are understood to share equal rights and responsibilities. But in the logic of traditional honor, there is no such mutual regard, no possibility of negotiation or compromise. Wounded honor demands nothing less than total satisfaction, either through death or some other social accepted, accepted compensation. And honor, sharaf, was the dominant 
uh, ethical logic for many decades prior to 2011. And in conclusion, despite the despair and misery in the following decade of the Arab Spring, the Karama paradigm is arguably one of the enduring legacies of 2011 that says the citizen's inherent worthiness and inalienable right is to make the system, even if that reality is still very far off. And there's a word that's used in linguistics, it's called autocognition. And the word means basically that when you know something, you see something, but you don't know how to describe it. And if you've ever been in love, I hope you all have somehow, uh, it's, and you can't find the words to, to try and express your feelings. Or if you see a disaster and your vocabulary cannot keep up with your emotions. And that is kind of what the state of the Arab world is in. There has been, if not a literal destruction, there has been a metaphorical destruction where a lot of things just do not make sense. There is a nihilism that has pervaded um, you know, from Morocco to Iraq, but in different intensities. And I think it is really up to the task of civil society workers and activists, policymakers, uh, as well as students, to try and make sense of this by looking at looking for a new language, looking for something that can give that can give order to chaos. Because right now we're talking about a state of nihilist values, attacks on pluralism, zero-sum game power struggles with each party backed by different uh, regional powers. And these are questions that we should always be thinking about and how do we address this? And Connect Karama, for me, is just one contribution of many contributions. Uh, and one of the areas that I look, like to look at, perhaps, like I look, I, I look more specifically in Berlin because there's a very big Arab exile space there. But one could also think about this in the context of Madrid. What can Madrid do uh, in the context of its relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world uh, in trying to formulate this new way of thinking, new worldview that we desperately need? And I, when I say desperate, I just don't mean Arabs. I mean those who are invested in the welfare of the Arab world. And um, I will end with this quote from Eric Fromm. He wrote a book in uh, 1941, the German writer, uh, Eric Fromm, uh, called Escape from Freedom. And I'll read it twice, just to um, get it through. The more the drive toward life is thwarted, the stronger is the drive toward destruction. The more life is realized, the less is the strength of that destructiveness. Destructiveness is the outcome of unlived life. Let me say it one more time, it's really important. The more the drive toward life is thwarted, the stronger is the drive toward destruction. The more life is realized, the less is the strength of destructiveness. Destructiveness is the outcome of unlived life. And in a nutshell, what he means is that we can talk about the freedom from, it's easy to take down a regime, it's easy to break free from prison, that is freedom from. The freedom too asks you, what do you create next? What do you bring about next? That is the freedom too. And that's not the easier freedom, but it's the more important freedom. And Hannah Arendt, the German Jewish philosopher would say, that's the highest freedom, is to create something, to start a new beginning. And so that question really remains of how do we always move to a better place, irrespective of the international climate, but how do we move to a better place, even if incrementally? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Amr, eh, eh, por estas, eh, estas reflexiones. Eh, Thank you very much for your reflections. We can now begin the questions and answers session. You can ask your questions both here and online, thanks to my colleagues here. I would like to go back to the topic of dignity and the word karama. Where does that movement come from? I've read the article, so I know that you explore a very interesting dimension in your article. You talk about a new vision for the future. That is the change in Arab societies 
in Arab youth, they see a possibility to connect beyond national states. We've seen it in the so-called Arab Spring. Communities have been created, even though virtual communities. We have the example of Berlin, where a dialogue can take place between Iraqi people, Egyptians, and people from other Arab countries. Do you think this dimension is an appropriate pillar for this new vision of the world? this new social contract that uh, is being uh, created in the Arab world. Okay, thank you, Karim. I think I, I got it from the translator. Um, the, if we're talking about the, the new uh, the reality, I think, we, you know, I think we need to take a, a meta-narrative, a grand history a view of things. And I tend to be a fan of meta-narratives of the big story. And if we look at the you know, uh, Jews who fled uh, Europe in the 1930s, they went to New York, and New York became that intellectual capital for them. Uh, the same thing with Latin Americans who left Latin America in the dictatorship period which in the 70s and 80s and came to Paris and made Paris an intellectual capital. Now, we're seeing the same phenomenon in Berlin and in lesser uh, other cities including Madrid and Amsterdam, Barcelona, and so forth. It is not unusual for ideas to begin in the periphery uh, and then come to the center. This is not historically unusual. It's not unusual for exiles to return back when the political climate is back in their favor, uh, as in a, in a pluralistic democratic uh, favor. Uh, whether that it means a social contract or not is, is really a different question. It, it, it's, a, it's a matter really that goes also back to the inhabitants of the Arab world. I don't want to pa paint a rosy picture because the situation is very, very dire. We're talking about increased suicides amongst uh, Arab youth. You know, the, even if 2011 had economic problems, people still had hope. But now you're talking about the evacuation of hope. Um, across the region, and, 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 it, and it varies from country to country. Uh, what I will say also with the post-2011 post wave who left uh, the Arab world, they're not the same as the pre-2011 wave, uh, because many of them who have left are not leaving necessarily for economic reasons, uh, where their parents might have gone to the Gulf, Dubai and Kuwait and all that. These were economic reasons, and they couldn't do politics, so they could legally stay. But we're talking about an interesting, peculiar type of zeitgeist that's arising uh, and that has been in motion for many years that are now you know, um, mushrooming in Europe um, and, and North America. So the question is, what can come, of, come, come out of that? You know, uh, will it be a, a, a social contract? Will it be uh, however you define that? Is it a school of thought? Is it an ideational movement? Uh, but what I mean is to be political means you have to actively think about it. It cannot just organically come about like that. I think if that's uh, if I answer the question. What about the kinetic objective? The, yes, the okay. The idea of the kinetic is to try and give sense to the way people react since 2011. Uh, it's, it's not the same sort of passive way that it was done before. People are always trying to find spaces of dignity through and through. I'm not saying this is a different type of human being after 2011, but the social reactions are very different because they've seen a precedent happen. And when you've seen, seen precedents, you know, and you are the ruler, you are in trouble because sometimes it feels like, you know, your time could come up any time. When Ben Ali was uh, sent on a one-way ticket to Saudi Arabia, in 2011, it was unimaginable because for us, an Arab leader can only die in office <laughs> or overthrown by a brother or something. But it really was so surreal to see, and this had not happened for three generations, okay? So it was so unusual to see that. So when you look at the everyday life uh, of the behavior of individuals across the Arab world, it is 
it says something about salvaging dignity. Now, on a minimal level, someone that enters the mosque or the church doesn't do it because, or doesn't only do it because that is a religious obligation. They do it because they can retrieve some dignity that they can't get on the streets. And it doesn't have to be police violence. It could be just hyper-capitalism and consumer society. And the worship space gives them 15 minutes of breathing, and then they exit again. But to think actively can be seen in the way people might be behave with the police or, uh, or what Tunisians are doing at the moment, uh, protesting because of the, uh, you know, because I, if, if, are they, okay, when you're saying coup, I'm not sure what's the, what's the, uh, the latest words that's, um, uh, but the constitutional, uh, you know, uh, a theft, for lack of a better term, <laughs> because uh, Twitter can be a bit of a, uh, a wildfire with, with the terms that I used. Uh, it reminds me of Egypt in 2013 when we had this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> can we call it the coup? No, it's a revolution. Is it a coup? Is it... Anyway. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Amr. Uh, preguntas de este de, de aquel. Would you like to ask any questions? Let me take the microphone to you. First of all, I would like to thank the speakers. I'll uh, pose my question in Spanish to you because I have a very specific doubt regarding the concept of karama. I wanted to ask you, your opinion, Hayat Karama, that is a cooperation program that has been implemented in Egypt into, in order to revitalize uh, rural areas. So do you think Karama is a way to redefine this concept or what can Karama mean in this concept, in this program in Egypt? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. I, I don't know specifically about this program, but I do know uh, it has been used a lot by governments uh, in the region, more than they would have used it before. Uh, so like when we saw in 2014, the, the, the Libya operation by Hafta, backed by uh, the UAE in Egypt was called Operation Karama. Uh, so yes, the counter-revolution can use it too. Uh, that's not unusual. Uh, it's, it's a word, it's, it's democratically available to everyone to use. Uh, but the fact that it's used and contested says something, that it really, it matters. It has, it's a loaded term that has uh, impetus, it has uh, power uh, in, in its use. Um, but I am just of, of the, I'm just of, this, of the stance that there has been a shift, uh, a linguistic shift, and you could even say a mindset shift since 2011, where it has moved from Sharaf to Karama. Now, I do, now I do remember uh, one young woman uh, during a talk um, in the audience complained that the word Karama is used as a, you know, to oppress people as well, you know, like, because now even, you know, karamat al-balad and, and the dignity of the nation again, and we're going through that same cycle. And yes, it, it can be uh, it can be oppressive in that in that sense. But once again, it, it's a word that I am using to try and make sense of changes um, and what changes are coming about from the engagement in that sense. Uh, and I think when we really flesh out karama, we can really give justice to it even if it's used superficially in other circumstances. Otras preguntas? Any other questions? No. Vale, pues vamos a, eh, Martin, si podemos poner el video de... Martin, de la... can we please play the video, the modern Arab state? While we wait for questions uh, from the audience here or from our visual audience. So-called Arab Spring continued to threaten the palaces of Arab rulers. Despite its volatility, chaos, uncertainty and cost, several unexpected changes have shaped the future of the Middle East and North Africa region since 2011. Economic and political problems are the main struggle in Tunisia and Egypt. Civil war and division in Libya, Yemen, and Syria, amplified by regional and external interventions. A countrywide revolutionary process in Lebanon. 
government resignations in Algeria and Iraq, jailing of the dictator of Sudan, constitutional reforms in Morocco and Jordan, transformation of monarchical foundations in Saudi Arabia. The Arab youth who filled the streets of their cities are paying a huge price for a dignified life. أصبحت هذه المجتمعات اليوم في حالة تحضير كامل وفي حالة من اليقظة والوعي للانتفاضة في أي لحظة ضد أي أنظمة حاكمة إذا شعرت أنها ممكن أن تصادر حقها في الحكم قوة التغيير عند الأجيال الشبابية الصاعدة ساهمت بشكل كبير ببناء دولة عربية حديثة بأجود الأنظمة الديمقراطية I don't believe in the existence of a modern Arab state because the status quo of the regimes in Arab countries where uprisings took place remains the same. So I think the Arab Spring has failed. This book comes 10 years after the beginning of the Arab uprisings. It brings together scholars from the region who did follow closely the developments of the last decade. And its chapters cover subjects as encompassing as the social contract, political systems, the place of youth, social movements and the economic situation. The overarching idea is that the movement that started in 2010 continues. Its preconditions are still there, the attempts to solve them stalled, and the popular explosions witnessed in Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan or Algeria by the end of the 2010s show that the aftershocks are not over and that the region is far from regaining stability. With the partial exception of Tunisia, the regimes of the Middle East and North Africa failed to catch the signals sent by their younger citizens and proved unable to engage in serious reforms. The ruling class remained largely unchanged, and the authoritarian systems were simply upgraded. In 2011, the concept of social contract was being debated across the region, and thinkers and politicians alike agreed that it should be reformed. In the most authoritarian systems, therefore, such as the Gulf states or Assad Syria, reforms were announced during that year. However, and they only consolidated the systems in place. So for Amr Ali, the protest cries of Karama dignity in 2011 saw the bottom-up emergence of a new subjectivity in the Arab world that birthed a new citizenship paradigm and elevated the citizenry as a compelling sovereign collective. Hence, Lina Khatib, considers the emergence of a new political classification of regimes post-2011. Many political systems have not changed significantly since the start of the uprisings, or merely witnessed cosmetic reforms. Other systems have undergone notable transformations. These transformations can broadly group it under five categories. The failing state, the military state, the democratizing state, the autocratic state, and the mandated state. It is against this clerical system that the youths of the MENA region have revolted, as noted by Yusuf Sharif. In a continuation of protest cycles that started during colonial times, the generation born in the 80s revolted against its leaders and took to the streets. The results were mitigated. Some of these youths ended up killed or jailed, others excluded, others simply cosmetically included, and others were completely disillusioned. They gave up on politics and civil society and joined violent and anarchic groups. These young people face not only closed political systems, but also a collapsing or outdated economic structure that pains to include them. Muslim Tour, accordingly, looks at the interaction between political structures and economic performance and argues that politics dominates economics in the region. For her, as long as the Arab states continue to prioritize regime survival and reproduce the ruling coalitions composed of security apparatuses and crony capitalists, their economic performance will continue to be negative. Nader Qabani follows Tour's ideas when he looks at the international political economy of the region since 2011. For him, the popular protests were a response to the Arab states' inability to keep their end of their social contract with their citizens, a social contract that is an authoritarian bargain in which citizens exchanged political rights for economic entitlements. Most of these regimes have opted to increase repression and authoritarian control rather than provide citizens with greater political participation, economic opportunities, or social justice. The book concludes with a series of reflections 
about what is required from MENA regimes to emerge out of this dilemma. After all, it is in the hands of the people and future generations to define what the modern Arab state will look like. Follow Cass Paul Med on social media in order to learn more about the book and their project activities. Bueno, pues, um, no sé si hay... Well, I don't know whether there are any further questions. Yes, I think there's one. Hola, eh, mi Hi, thank you very much for your uh, lectures. And uh, thanks to Casa Arabe and the Autonomous University of Madrid and CAS for organizing this event. Um, one question for Amro. I loved your presentation, but uh, I'm most interested in, in this uh, uh, shift from the nationalist uh, martyr and the citizen martyr. Could you, could you speak some three minutes about that? Thank you. Uh, the, there are different views of what happened with that shift, uh, but also it had a lot to do uh, with the way the word Shalaf Ona was used uh, in the later, tw later 20th century, because it often it was saying, it, basically the argument to maintain regime stability was that it's not all about you. It's about you know the, the the nation, and we have to keep it safe from the imperialists, from Israel, from you know uh, the U.S. Uh, real and imagined, you know. So the thing is, is that there was always a focus on those who serve those interests, which, which tends to be nationalists and military figures. Uh, hence, why a lot of streets in our border are named after dead, dead nationalists. Uh, the shift may have come about with the sort of the rise of. Uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism in the 90s, but also which came packaged with it, uh, individualism. Uh, so that could have been one positive side effect of individualism in the 90s. But also, I, I think the key turning point uh, beyond just the uh, individual character was uh, the uh, the Muhammad al uh, with the murder in, of him in 2000, and the the sort of elevation of this ordinary. Uh, figure. Remember, I mean, it wasn't like a clear-cut shift, but we're talking about a shift where the most ordinary people in the 2000s become heroes and martyrs, um, who were not serving any sort of military or national role. They were just doing what they do every day. Bozizi selling fruits, Khaled Saeed in an internet cafe, and all that. So the the shift comes about with also the exhaust, exhaustion with the status quo with, uh, you know, that uh, when you are maintaining a regime on conspiracies and, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, that we are your best guarantee, et cetera. Uh, and so, and, and all the nationalist icons are serving well the, the nation. Uh, we should, uh, yeah, that's the, the narrative goes, we should be supporting them. We should be lionizing them. Uh, but also there was just no, uh, which goes back to the essence of the book, there was just no social contract. Actually, we entered the era of unsocial contracts by the 1980s. So you've got the rise of violence, the rise of state violence, but you're not really getting anything in return. Not, I think that, not that I think there's any good compromise with state violence, but uh, there, you know, uh, subsidies were being removed, etc. So the more disenchanted a person became or the public became with the state, et cetera, the more sort of reflection, re, re envisioning of what could be uh, different in that sense. Alguna otra? Some other comments or questions? Yes, please. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the speakers um, for the reasons they have given us to, to question ourselves and to wonder what is, uh, what is the, uh, the future for this social contract, what lies ahead. Um, it is uh, something that has been uh, a long-running issue 
it started in the 80s and then there was this general deterioration across the Arab countries and it ended up in, in uh, quite a deep gap, a deep uh, fracture in many Arab countries. And uh, well, so what do you think this new needs, this new need for a social contract is leading us to where what's what lies ahead maybe it's a i'm abusing of your patience but uh, please bear with me because in the video we've seen some turkish um, people also um, uh, make some statements so what is the role of religion of religiosity of religious beliefs in this crisis in this uh, fracture and do you think that uh, some peripheral elements that are non-Arab elements are going to be um, uh, benefiting from all this? You know, uh, Turkey, some other countries that are just in the periphery and uh, that uh, with their religiosity are, you know, having a bearing an influence on the future of Arab countries. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, how does one go about answering this? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, and I will give you sort of two uh, different historical contrasts. So when the Arab uh, movement in the 19th century and early 20th century called the Nahda, which means Renaissance, if you read their writings, they were writing 50 years into the future. You know, so they were that visionary, even if most things didn't come you know, to light in a good way for them. But they were the fact that they could see half a century away through novels or through uh, prose and, and, and writings and all that, what's phenomenal. Today, if we can see five years ahead, that would be amazing. Just five years. <laughs> because the amount of changes is, that's happening in not just the Arab world, but in the world is extremely disorienting. It, it cannot be easy being a policy maker or a politician or an activist or, or any of that. We just, we've lost that, uh, we're living in that sort of liquid age. We're just, we're losing that sense of borders and uh, like lines and, and, and names and structures to make sense of things. Uh, but we still have to try. And, and we write in the conclusion of possible outcomes. And there are three possible outcomes. And I'll be very reductionist here, uh, just to deliver the point, is that either things stay the same, things get worse, or things get better or marginally better. There's actually a strong case for all three. Uh, it is weak. The most likely scenario could be just the status quo continuing and going up and down and etc. The, 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 the much worse scenario is also a possibility because every year we, we think we've seen the worst, the next year surprises us. Then the case for things getting better is that, okay, we've seen the worst. Um, this is all they can do. We now have to think differently, step back and, and do things in a different way. That's, and I mean that much in a much more collective sense. It is really, really hard to, uh, you know, say with certainty, okay, this is gonna be uh, the case. And also people experience oppression very differently in our world. I, you know, someone, you know, in, in Cairo is not like someone in Dubai, it, it's not, uh, and they have a different idea of oppression. Everyone is just, if, if, but we, what we can say is that they do share uh, a very, uh, a core political economy and the social contracts that have collapsed and they now need to be renamed. And that's what I do in the chapter. Uh, so we, we don't have the same social contract. Actually, no Arab country has the same social contract as before 2011. It's changed in some significant way, in one way or another. Regarding uh, the point of really, religiosity, uh, I, I think the high tides of uh, Islamist religion, if that's what you're referring to, has actually passed. And I say that from, say, the gravity center, where it is much stronger in Egypt than other Arab countries, where I think the high tide was from 2005 to 2012. That's just a rough, and, um, and it's not the same as it used to be, uh, where people used to fear it as a threat, for example. Uh, but if you're talking about uh, religiosity as a, as a coping mechanism, as a value system, 
uh, that is something that's always being negotiated every day. We just have to remind ourselves that whatever we see Erdogan doing, whatever we see you know, the Arab presidents and kings doing with religion isn't really religion. It's more of a form of Baroque Islam, I call it, you know, uh, where they use theatrics to legitimize the rule. Um, it's, if it was really about religion, they would be talking about the Uyghurs in China, for example, or they wouldn't be secretly sending them back, for example. But it's really not about religion. It's, uh, and, and, and one final point I'll say is that uh, the, the, the modern incarnation of Islamism is a very modern phenomenon. It's not medieval. I think if it was medieval, then we'd be expecting them to translate Plato and Aristotle's texts. <laughs> awesome. Bueno, pues, ah, sí, venga, una preguntita. Just one last question, then. Yeah, at the back of the room. Si puede conservar la mascarilla, por favor. Please, with your mask on. With your mask, face mask on, please. Well, good evening, everyone. And thanks to Casa Arabe for having organized this uh, conference. Maybe I can ask my question in Arab, in Arabic. Yes, but we cannot translate it, I'm sorry. Puedo. <coughs> bueno, voy a hablar con Arabe. Tejadetza fi mudakhalatika an, an el karama. Kayfa tandor ila mustaqbal al duel al arabia wa hali tagheerat lati qamat biha al andima siyasiya kafiya li tagheer hayat al muwatin al arabi sawa fi kafat al duel al arabia. Pregunta como ves el futuro. What I'm asking about, as you can see, is about the future of Arab countries and uh, whether what uh, the uh, political authorities in Arab countries is enough so for, for their populations to have a good life, to live a good life, and uh, to have karama and everything they need. I'm just going to the question. You say karama مش مح... مش مح... مش 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 بتهمل الدولة ولا ده اللي أنا فهمته يعني لا ممكن تاني أه سوري مس يعني بالنسبة للمستقبل كرامات في ال في ال في الدول العربية صح well, uh, you have to answer in English because. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, I, sorry, I'm sorry. My apologies, my apologies. Okay, so. we have. <laughs> For a second, I thought I was in, I was in Cairo. Okay, uh, so look, it's 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 a very very. It's a very difficult question if we're looking at okay, what is the future of uh, the Arab countries when it comes to the idea of karama? My view is that I took a a stance away from the states, even though we talk about the state in the book, but my chapter also fo focuses on the citizen, on the citizen's role, uh, because there, there are some situations that are, actually there's a lot of situations that are really beyond our control. So the question is to the small man and woman in all these villages and towns and cities across the Arab world, how do they uh, understand the karama? How do they regain it? How do they salvage their dignity? in everyday life. Uh, and, you know, I will give you a story of a, of a man who took, uh, who I, I spoke to in, in Siwa. So this uh, was a, uh, a, a Berber sheikh, uh, 86 years old. He has seen a lot. Uh, in, so Siwa is, a, is a, a town in Western Egypt, a very beautiful oasis town. Uh, and I asked him a question. I said, which is the best era you've lived in? And, and, I, he, and he said to me, I don't understand the question. And I said to him, which did you like the era of Nasser, Sadat, Mubarak, today? Who? <laughs> King Farouk? He goes, they were all good. But I'm like, uh, can I, well, don't you see what's happening around? And is it not troubling you? And, and he said, uh, look, son, when I, in 1941, when the Nazis came and they took over Siwa, it was the Nazis and, and the Italians, so the Germans and the Italians. And he told me that the, the, he remembers the German soldiers 
uh, paying for their goods, you know, where the Italian soldiers would kick the door and steal the honey, etc. And it was a really interesting, like, uh, sort of explanation of how he frames his worldview. And he goes, this was my idea of Kurama. This was my idea to remember only the good points. And every period of my life, I really focus on the, the blessings I had through. And he quotes me the ayah from the Quran that says, what you think is good for you is not good, might not be good for you. And what is bad for you might be uh, good for you. So the, the, the point was is that even down to an, an unknown, well, he's, he's quite known in his area, but uh, the person is that everyone is going to understand karma. We are, the 99% of the population is away from parliaments and away from state legislatures and presidents and ministers, etc. The best that we can do in our respective spaces uh, is to try and understand that karma and how to widen it. Because the space of responsibility varies from the head of the state down to the security man outside a building. Everyone is going to understand their scope of responsibility and uh, karama. And in our respective fields, literature, uh, political science, sociology, etc., we need to make that much clearer. Because I think as academics, as students, as public intellectuals, we have an interventionist role as well. We cannot just be in our bubbles, in our ivory towers. We need to get out there. Uh, within, of course, within reason, within safety of the country, uh, country in question that we're talking about, and uh, speak our voices. Once again, with intelligence. We don't want any more people in prison. Thank you very much, Amro Ali, for these last uh, words, and uh, thank you all very much for your questions. And I'd like to finish with something now that you've mentioned this uh, dimension of trying to uh, get out of our bubbles and you mentioned in your essay uh, you know how difficult it is how challenging it is for arab citizens to travel from one country to the next you said that uh, in you know in any uh, travel book travel guide and you, they tell you, okay, how you can go to, from Madrid to Prague, you know, a backpacking route. But the same thing cannot be done or cannot be said from Casablanca to Beirut. So it's um, it's impossible. You cannot go backpacking from uh, one place to the other. So this is also uh, restricting the possibilities that citizens have. And now that we have this huge crisis, between um, uh, Algeria, Algeria and Morocco, two neighboring countries that are currently have um, uh, you know, stopped that possibility of transit. So, well, of course, we could be discussing many, many other things, many other different dimensions, but this is the end of our uh, university classroom. Um, I'd like to thank Amra Ali and Fadia Fakir, and with a really, um, I um, uh, apologize for not having been able to hear the uh, um, Hadia's presentation um, very well here in Casa Arabe. Hopefully, you'll be able to listen to it in on our website. And thanks uh, to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for the uh, participation and uh, Nieves Arabella from the UAM. And uh, uh, just uh, let me remind you that uh, we will be holding our next conference on this uh, uh, series, this series about uh, around the uh, environment. And um, now uh, you have the book outside and just uh, right outside the door. And Lina Hatib, she was uh, the one who opened this uh, uh, series of conferences one year ago in the second edition. And yeah, yeah, and the book is free. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you all very much. See you next time.